Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here, and uh, particularly pleased to have these good questions. They, some of them are pretty tough, but they really are, uh, are I, I think, very basic. I want to start off with, with one which, to which I can tie some of the others, and that is how much do I think that research on animal behavior will contribute to an understanding of and modification of human behavior. In the Behavior of Organisms, published nearly 40 years ago, time flies, uh, I said that I thought the only difference, that it, shall I repeat? Or, uh, all right. I thought that the only difference that uh, I expected to see between animals and what I used to call men, people, was in the field of verbal behavior. And I still think that's true. I got around to doing a book on verbal behavior 20 years later, published in 1957. But that doesn't simply mean that animals suddenly start talking and that's all there is to it. The uh, essential thing is that once verbal behavior became possible, and I think that was due to uh, an evolutionary process that brought the vocal musculature under what I would call operant control, call it voluntary control if you like, up to that point, it had been associated with instinctive cries and so on. But once that became, well, it became possible to, to put it crudely, to use speech for, to, to be effective, to produce results, then you could have a culture emerge in which people began to ask each other, <clears throat> what are you doing, why are you doing that? In other words, they began to set up the conditions that led people to look at their own behavior and look at themselves and their own uh, bodily processes when they were behaving. I regard consciousness, awareness, as a social product. I can't imagine how the individual would ever become a conscious individual unless there were other people to provide the contingencies that lead him or her to, to ask questions of that nature. Many people have said, well, how does the behavior deal with the unconscious? Well, that's easy. All behavior begins as unconscious behavior, but some of it becomes conscious when you look at it, analyze it, look at the external conditions under which this behavior occurs, look at the states of your body with which you are in contact, these you call your feelings, your states of mind, and you are then able to talk about these things. Now, a very large part of a culture which makes it so helpful and enables the individual to do so much more as a member of a culture than would be possible as a single individual has to do with making use of the experience of other people. You give someone advice. Now, what does that mean? You yourself have been in contact with some situation, and by describing what you do and the results you get, another person can avoid all of the exploratory behavior which led to that discovery. For example, if you just arrived in Miami, you might find a good restaurant through a process of just going and eating here, 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 and here until finally you find one which happens to be the kind of restaurant you like. But if you know someone who, who knows your tastes, that person can say, if you like good Italian food, go to Luigi's. I don't know whether there is a Luigi, so I'm not really puffing anybody up here. Um, that, that, is a, that sentence contains two things. One, uh, a description of behavior, go to a restaurant, and another one, and, uh, and, uh, some kind of reference to a reinforcing consequence. Go to that restaurant and you will get a good Italian meal. Now, once that has happened, you don't need to bother going all over Miami till you find a good Italian restaurant. And that's a very useful thing. The, the advice that one person gives another, the warnings that one gives another, the maxims and proverbs, which are sort of general kinds of advice that, that a culture can develop, these become extremely important. And I've argued, and I think I've convinced myself, that governmental and scientific laws are of this nature. They describe behavior and its consequences, and hence can be used instead of the kind of shaping behavior that have to go on otherwise. Someone has said that it's rather ridiculous 
if to shape the behavior of a person, as you shape the behavior of a, of a rat or a pigeon, when you can simply tell the person what to do. If I, uh, if I wanted to get a, 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 a chimpanzee, for example, to pull a plunger of a vending machine, I know how I would do it. I could shape that behavior fairly quickly, and the, the, the chimp would learn to pull a plunger and get a bit of something edible. Um, but uh, if it were a person, I could simply say, pull a plunger and you'll get the pack of cigarettes or whatever it is that's going to come out. Uh, the, the instruction on the vending machine, pull plunger and press button under pack of cigarettes, these are instructions, they're advice, and it saves you the trouble of fumbling around with all of the equipment in the whole environment until finally you, some, you find something which produces a pack of cigarettes. Um, that is, of course, extraordinarily valuable. It does not mean that there's nothing, that there's something wrong with the process of shaping behavior, because until you have acquired the behavior of following instructions, nothing else is available. And that is why, with animals, that's about all you have. You can teach animals a, an imitative repertoire, so you can teach a new response by giving an imitative model. It's very difficult to do, but you do it. And we do it with children. Uh, we use verbal, uh, verbal descriptions of contingencies and imitative modeling uh, so that the child watching someone get something immediately knows what to do. But that doesn't come free. It's only after the child has learned to imitate that that is possible. So that you don't, you don't avoid the essential shaping process in the first place. Now, the cognitive psychology, and the point I made this morning, is concerned with the way you talk about contingencies the way you give reasons for doing things. And when I say, if you want uh, a good Italian dinner, go to Luigi's, that, I give you reasons why you should go to Luigi's, because you get a good dinner when you do that. And this kind of thing is, of course, uh, very commonly done, and it is, it is the rational side of human behavior. But Freud saw what was wrong with that. I can say to a person, pull the plunger and you get his pack of cigarettes. But suppose this person is uh, ruining himself gambling. And I say to him, okay, Tim, I can give you some very good advice, stop gambling. That's that. I'll give you reasons for stop gambling. If you stop gambling, you won't lose money. So you stop. Yes, but you don't. You see, the contingencies are more powerful there than the reasons. Now, the reasons are descriptions of the contingencies, but you don't have uh, reasons to follow the reasons. And so you go right on gambling. And that's a problem that, that uh, therapists face. You can give a patient reasons for behaving well, but that isn't enough, as Freud was very clearly pointed this out. Uh, Freud would say with the unconscious reasons, by unconscious reasons, all he means, all I, I, all I would mean, and if I said the same thing, is that there are reinforcing contingencies, mostly reinforcing consequences, which are strengthening behavior in opposition to what appear to be the, the reasons that society gives you for behaving in a given way. As you, you know that if you want to get along better with your wife, you should stop nagging or should stop complaining, stop to bed, and so on. All right, um, those are reasons, and probably they're correct. On the other hand, it's terribly reinforcing to you to find that she's wrong in this and complain about this and complain about that and so on, so that is what you do. There are, there are reinforcing consequences to determine the behavior. The reasons given uh, aren't enough. And I think main, the main problem, really, in therapy, it seems to me one of the problems in face-to-face -face therapy with, with just not, not a psychotic, but, uh, but a neurotic person, is, is to find the contingencies of reinforcement, which are the troublemaking effects, so that um, good reasons, which are descriptions of better contingencies, can actually uh, work.